Okay, our next uh, presentation will be uh, Planning and Conducting Removal Operations, the SA Experience. Uh, John Virtue will be presenting that. He's from Biosecurity SA. Over to you, sir. Thanks very much. Um, so I suppose I'll be taking a, a, um, a state sort of jurisdictional response to my presentation. Um, I'm manager of weeds, pest animals and aquatic pests in Biosecurity South Australia, part of Prime Industries and Regions South Australia. I'm also the South Australian representative on, on the Intergovernmental Vertebra Pest Committee, which developed the um, National Feral Camel Action Plan and has got responsibility for oversight and the continued implementation of that. I'd like to acknowledge my PERSA co-authors there, Paul O'Leary, Phil G and Nick Sikkim, who are all in the audience. Um, Paul's the current and Nick's the former uh, State Project Manager for the um, rollout in South Australia. And Phil G from Real Solutions has sort of been a linchpin in terms of his um, knowledge, experience and networks in feral camel management. Also, I just want to acknowledge that this is very, very much a partnership within governments in South Australia. So the Department of Environment, Water and Natural Resources has um, been very much a collaboration and thank Bretton Greer for being one of the linchpins there. And lastly, I suppose, in terms of we've talked a lot about the complexity of the project, um, uh, this is really, I suppose, thanks to Ninti One and particularly for a national pest, it needs a national coordinator. So thanks very much for, to Quentin for, for keeping the, the, um, the project together and it wouldn't have rolled out without the, his support and guidance. So in terms of um, the removal operations, one of the key things we've talked about, I suppose, right up front was um, the, the consultation. And removal operations are underpinned by, by landholder aspirations. And essentially pest management is primarily a, um, a landholder's responsibility, um, I mean, they're the primary beneficiary of control, the, whether it's a, a direct environmental or economic or social benefit to them from that control. And it's their, their, uh, their, they've become the primary, I, I suppose, person or persons in terms of choosing on how, how um, camel control can occur. But they also need, they need to be in worse support in terms of how they make that decision. So consultation was required to achieve the most effective and acceptable control outcomes, and it considers a range of indigenous, cultural, social factors. I mean, non-indigenous uh, and indigenous lands were involved. Um, it's important to utilise and recognise that local expertise and that local experience, and, and consultation, I suppose, has been a fundamental one in terms of our, our contracts with the, 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 the project in terms of how we're engaged to do this. And as I said before, there's, there's also consultation across government. I mean, this... Um, project, I think, in some respects, has been more about mustering people than camels, not about culling people, but certainly mustering is sort of a good analogy that that's been important to, um, to uh, get everybody heading toward the same direction. In terms of determining removal methods, South Australia very early, early on, and it was a lot of, I suppose, high-level policy discussion, said we're not going to choose one method over another. It's that landholder choice, but we recognise the benefits and, and the um, abilities that arise out of both aerial culling and mustering and or, or a combination of both. But in determining that removal method, that's that landholder choice, that landholder aspirations. Um, you've also got to weigh up the effectiveness of um, particular techniques. And in some cases, logistics certainly comes into that. For example, some areas, um, there just simply isn't the, the, uh, the facility set up for, for mustering uh, or the landscapes, there may simply not be accurate access. You've got the... Um, the seasonal conditions that affect camel congregations, you've got the inherent density. Um, for South Australia, the northwest part of the state, the APY lands is the highest density area. Um, are there particular cultural sites at risk? What are the key environmental assets? What's the on-ground intelligence? It's not just the past aerial surveys, it's also um, what, are the, what are the locals telling us? And then it comes down to what are the available resources to be able to respond. In terms of... Um, Operational planning, it's not a simple, okay, there's some camels there, off we go, we'll do that tomorrow. There's a lot of planning goes into having a successful operation. Um, at Intelligence, we um, put out satellite collars in both the Simpson Desert and the Great Victoria Desert regions, and that certainly um, became very fundamental, particularly towards the end with, um, with the Simpson, where it was essentially taking a Judas collar approach to detect the um, very few camels that were remaining in that area. That importance of that um, intelligence network we had through Real Solutions monthly reports coming back of where camel congregations or camels have been observed. Um, relying on both sort of formal stratified aerial surveys but also reconnaissance flights to see where, where they are our camels at the moment. Um, logistics are sort of down on the back of the guy in the truck but logistics I suppose is a key thing. I mean where do you base people? Where can you land planes? Where do you move fuel, um, your ground access? Um, your restrictions in terms of your flying hours before your brakes, make sure you've got shooters with brakes. What's the weather conditions going to be like? What's the forecast in a couple of weeks' time we're planning to go out? That all impacts on what's possible. 
and a welfare is a key consideration, um, and we've got the codes of practice and standard operating procedures. Um, but a fundamental one for us is um, for the aerial culling that was done through um, trained government staff, accredited skills marksmen, that was, that was vital. Safety um, in terms of helicopter choice, in terms of hours, in terms of firearm use, in terms of simply working in remote areas. And, um, and that, that for the initial consultation process, where are the no-go zones for sort of cultural sensitivities, where are the target areas, and communications um, both within the team, uh, who's in the helicopter, who's back on the ground, communications back to um, the state level, and um, there is important to have protocols for decisions and command structure. Um, you're not just out there, okay, everyone go and do their own thing, there needs to be quite a, a rigid who's doing what, how the decision's made. We developed a number of decision support tools. Um, it wasn't just do we think it's a good idea, off we go. Um, we engaged with EcoKnowledge to develop a decision support system which considered both fixed and variable costs and the benefits, such as um, uh, particular environmental assets at risk to decide is this a, a worthwhile, beneficial, cost-effective um, operation to go in and do a, a, an area of coal in a certain area. And there are also other um, decision tools in terms of is mustering or, or at the high level mustering or, or area of coal the option. Um, one we don't have up on screen there is sort of with API Wildlands recently taken quite a pictorial approach in terms of working through for them as a legacy of the project. How do they decide what's the most appropriate action where they have a, an issue of um, camel impacting on community or, or impacting on waters? In terms of uh, aerial coal, it is, as I say, it is a rapid response, but there is still that time lag because you've guys basically got to have everything lined up to be able to go and have a successful response. But in terms of being, have that capacity of a rapid response, there were landholder agreements, um, again, engaging with landholders, giving them that discussion about what are your options in terms of removal, there's aerial coal, there's mustering, what are your preferences in that regard. Having a memorandum of understanding with Department of Environment, Water and Natural Resources, which is the aerial coal capacity in South Australia. Um, so we've got agreement about how costs are shared, who's, who's doing what, um, having people on standby. Having the contract with the um, helicopter company and having, I suppose, a generic response plan there that um, we've got sort of, okay, just make sure we're ticking off all the boxes and getting that approved right up to, um, I suppose, right up through the departmental process because there are all health and safety obligations um, and there are animal welfare obligations, basically going to make sure all the boxes are ticked. And that comes back to the whole risk management approach that was talked about earlier on by Roger. The um, aerial coal is, yeah, I mean, it is very much at a landscape scale and um, talked about the, the survey and reconnaissance site, identifying hot spots and identifying no-go areas. Um, basically, you can't just cover the whole areas. You basically have to be very rational and uh, prioritise in terms of where you're going to get the most um, likely uh, numbers of feral camels or also where are the key assets that need protecting and where, um, in, the, in those areas. The, um, again, Bitter will follow up with the discussion on animal welfare, but um, we had uh, audits afterwards. There was instances of flight following behind the coal. I mean, that was verification that you're following the, the standard um, nationally um, endorsed processes. It was also, from an INTI perspective, verification that there was um, the camels uh, being removed were, as what we're saying, I suppose, that independent verification. Uh, I think a key feature and a key challenge with this national project has been it just simply is camels are in very remote areas. Um, it's making sure you've got the logistics set up for that. Also working across jurisdictional borders. So for example, on the recent um, coal in the Simpson that was going into the Northern Territory as well where there were collared camels. And it was, it was that requirement, and again, that consultation lining up with the Northern Territory government, Central Land Council in terms of what can be done across the borders. And we've also worked across into the Western Australian um, side as well in sort of in the Spinifex country area. The other approach we've taken, and it's really um, uh, been a key uh, area for the, for the APY lands up in the northwest part of the state, has been a mustering approach where the, the APY executive had a, a no shoot to waste uh, policy. So we focused there on a, a assistance, a removal assistance process that was, that was the landholder process. Um, it's followed through with, there was also, um, I suppose fundamental with that was the training. Um, Real Solutions developed a, a camel book and, and run, have run a number of training sessions on codes of practice, standard operating procedures. Um, just basic, um, how you deal with, uh, with mustering camels, the camel behaviour. Uh, as part of our process, well, there's audits of how the mustering is being done, is it complying, and also verification in terms of numbers coming off. 
The targeted removal assistance um, was something that there was, a, there was a fair bit of debate about it um, within sort of that intergovernmental committee with, at, at the start of the project. Um, and we, we worked towards that, got agreement on that. And that's been, it has been very much fundamental in terms of building that um, capacity and uh, building, I suppose, an ongoing um, uh, commercial environmental partnership in the APY lands and extending it into other parts of the country. Um, it was essentially it was used as a way to offset the costs and develop that supply chain, develop the people, develop the infrastructure and, and develop the markets. Uh, it's been important in terms of generating income and jobs, um, certainly been a big socioeconomic benefit of, of um, the expansion and development of mustering in the APY lands with the flow and effects into the broader local economy and fundamental to that has been the capacity, building that capacity in terms of animal welfare incomes, uh, animal welfare outcomes. So just to um, let's finish off, I suppose, uh, from, a, from a South Australian perspective, we've essentially had three, three regions of the state, the Simpson Desert, the APY lands, and the Great Victoria Desert over in the, the southwest part of the state as our areas of focus. Um, Simpson Desert, the camel density is down by over 90% now. It's well below that, that, that 0.1 target. Um, and there's been, a, a, we're looking to now redeploy satellite collars and, and camera trapping to, to continue on with the, the program. Um, APY lands, it's probably in the order of a third over the life of the project of camels on that area being removed and that will be continue to be removed and a lot of it's been about developing that, that supply chain essentially in terms of the mustering um, and also it developing it and getting the local ownership in terms of situations where, where we've got emergency management where there may be a, a public, um, public safety risk at uh, how, you, how you manage that. And for the Great Victoria Desert, which I suppose we didn't, at the beginning of the project, we didn't ex expect that would be an area of focus, but essentially it came up as, look, there are camels moving south, or there were probably, there were camels that were probably not even recognised as being there. Um, we've got a good collaboration there in terms of um, Aboriginal lands, so Yalata, conservation um, through the Department of Environment, um, camels impacting on the dog fence, public safety risk on the air highway, essentially um, that led to responses which um, effectively, I suppose, gave a triple bottom line outcome in terms of the benefits from that control and it set up a legacy of how to work together, how to respond to future events there. So overall, I suppose I'd like to, um, again, thank the, the, the project partners for the collaboration and support. And um, it, it has been, from, certainly from a South Australian perspective, a very successful project with a lot of uh, a legacy, a lot of... Um, there's certainly a strong drive to continue within South Australia. The rec there's a greater recognition of the impacts of camels and the, the feasibility of their control. There's this willingness to maintain and build, and build on the gains. We've got well-established partnerships now. We can all work together. We can all talk the same language. Uh, we've established a lot of processes and it's just flowed on to how we develop policy around large fell herbivores in South Australia. Thank you.